And on behalf of the Fellows of St. Cuthbert's Society and of the College, a very warm welcome to you to this, the 19th Annual Fellows Lecture. Um, for those of you who don't know, St. Cuthbert's Society is one of the oldest uh, um, collegiate bodies within the university. It was founded by undergraduates themselves at the end of the 19th century and became a college, one of the constituent colleges of the university about 20 years ago. So it's one of the more recent colleges, but one of the oldest uh, um, student bodies within the university, which is one of its unique features that we like to preserve. Um, the fellows of St. Cuthbert Society, <coughs> excuse me, the fellows of St. Cuthbert Society are a group of uh, members of the senior common room recognized by the college <clears throat> as contributing substantially to the life of the uh, of the college in some way. Um, I'm Robert Banks and I have the particular honor of chairing the fellows and this evening's lecture. Our speaker is Dr. Emma Wells, fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, historian, author and broadcaster the achievements uh, in those areas and her academic consultancy and, and administrative, administrative achievements are fascinating and, and uh, breathtaking in scope and uh, number. I might mention as examples, a research uh, consultancy for the British Museum's 2011 exhibition, Treasures of Heaven, Saints, Relics, uh, and devotion in medieval Europe, and in 2019, ecclesiastical advisor for the BBC drama series, Gentleman Jack. Some of you may have seen it. Dr. Wells was a B, has a BA uh, in history of art and an MA in building architecture, both from the University of York, and her PhD was uh, awarded by Durham University so uh, we're, it's a warm welcome to her returning this evening. One of our own, we might say. Um, so this evening we're going to uh, uh, we're going to hear about the triumphs, some of the triumphs and the tragedies of the people who built and used Europe's glorious Gothic cathedrals. Um, from Canterbury to Salisbury, and from York to Florence, enriching uh, our culture, art, and uh, architecture until the modern day. And it gives me great pleasure, therefore, to invite Dr. Wells to present her lecture, Heaven on Earth, How to Build a Cathedral. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for the uh, warm welcome and invitation from St. Cuthbert's. Mm -hmm. I think we'll be clear what is on screen. I just did that. Uh, oh, no, we'll, we'll go with the orange. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> right, got it. So back in May 2023, when the former Prince of Wales himself placed himself in the middle of Westminster Abbey at the centre of the lines of the cruciform arrangement plan to be crowned Britain's 40th reigning monarch as King Charles III, he walked among over a thousand years of history. Now, of course, the nation's greatest ecclesiastical treasure, arguably, but where kings and queens have been crowned, married, and buried. In fact, the abbey was once just a small minster church, and it was on a tiny island known as Thorny, or Thorn Island, known for its marshy landscape full of bramble bushes. And it grew, though, into a great monastery, a great monastery in need of a saint. Why? Well, the saints were important to churches, both big and small, as they were viewed as golden opportunities, if you will, not only for creating a prominent site of pilgrimage and bequeathment, but also in securing a political and financial position for the church. 
and thereby, in the case of Westminster, special royal protection. So returning then to Charles's coronation, after being anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the sword of offering was presented to him along with the sovereign scepter and golden orb before his ancestors, Edward the Confessor's crown, and that therefore adorned his head. But most importantly, he found himself seated on a very important piece of real estate. <laughs> with King Charles VI of, um, I uh, and the year 1603, the nation that was royally embodied at Westminster Abbey was no longer simply England, but it commenced a new Anglo-Scottish Union. For more than two centuries, this misshapen lump called the Stone of Scorn had been kept within the confines of the last early English king, St. Edward the Confessor's Chapel in the Abbey. It had been a symbol of Scottish kingship, but as a piece of Edward I's war booty, it became symbolic of English dominance over Scotland. But with the accession of James, however, this balance of symbolism altered. Nearly 400 years later, in 1996, the stone was finally returned to Scotland to reside in Edinburgh Castle, on condition that it continue to be deployed at Westminster Abbey for future coronations, in the function, of course, that the Abbey had fulfilled so consistently since William the Conqueror in 1066 on. Why? Well, Westminster Abbey is, and always has been, Cafford Angle, the nation's capital church belonging to the people. In simple terms, though, it is a role peculiar, that is, obviously a church that belongs directly to the monarch and not to any diocese. It does not come under the jurisdiction of a bishop or archbishop. And how does that differ from the rest? Well, European cathedrals as a whole, they developed a hybrid system of monastic and secular types. The latter, the secular churches, they were staffed by clergy known as canons, who provided spiritual and pastoral needs for the surrounding community. They could also own their own property and were free to roam public spaces outside of the immediate church walls. Now, monastic cathedrals, on the other hand, were, as the name suggests, were run by monks who followed reforms, those from the 10th century on. Um, and these, of course, monks, they had exchanged their layman's garb for the earthly hues of a habit and bound themselves to a particular rule or vows of obedience, chastity, silence, so on and so forth. And most commonly, they lived separately, closed off to the world as well, um, amid routines structured around the pattern of daily offices. Over time, though, what's interesting in, in England, confusion between these secular and monastic cathedrals forced the word minster to become associated with some cathedrals staffed by secular clergy, especially in England's north, in Beverly Minster, York Minster, Ripon Minster. Abbeys then, and usually small priories, were monastic too, and their precise organisation were dependent on the religious order operating them. <laughs> what they all were, however, were small cities in and of themselves, fueled by faith and guided by daring engineering, and their construction, of course, by medieval ecclesiastical masons and architects, forever changed how we build. Now, pushing the limits of their technology, their quest to reach celestial heights, though often came at many different prices, and we'll see this this evening, but these could come in the form of structural instability, mistake, fire, even ultimate collapse, financial ruin, political machinations, and so on and so forth. But this construction took place before the era of elaborate plans or drawings, we must remember that. Furthermore, the range of skills expected of masons was particularly extensive. They were responsible for hewing and squaring blocks of stone to sculpting it into very capitals. The entire process could often be in their hands. Is it any wonder then that mistakes, as we will see, occurred? But were these really mistakes? Now, so although earthly limitations brought some cathedrals, again, as we'll see, crashing to the ground, on the whole, they fulfilled the purpose of achieving heaven on earth. So like the builders in my book of the same name, Heaven on Earth, it's the aim of mine to disrupt your imagination of the cathedral today with a much greater understanding of those who built it. 
eavesdropping on those forgotten throughout the pages of history, who would have often or otherwise remain silent and give a voice to the tales of cathedral builders of the past, the when, how, why, and to what end. So let us begin. Well, across medieval Europe during this so-called age of faith, people of all ages and backgrounds united in daily labors that echoed the biblical construction of Babel's great tower with its top in the heavens as per Genesis 11. They would harness themselves like animals to wagons, so we hear in some of the sources. They would drag stone from quarries, hauling wood, grain, and other provisions, while an ever-present hum of song reverberated off the stones as they walked. All were on an effort to build the great Gothic cathedrals. Now then, this was a cathedral building enterprise, a cathedral crusade, if you will, sustained by kings, church chapters, abbots, nobles, but then also even the lowest rungs of the social ladder. The organization of manpower and women power, as I will come on to, was akin to a well-run metropolis. These prominent yet curious living, breathing organisms of stone were thus intertwined with sort of a motley crew, if you will, and a roller coaster of dizzying highs and terrifying lows, varying fortunes and losses. They all contributed to creating these wonderful structures. They were houses of gold, glorious ships transporting souls between heaven and earth. But how did that occur? Well, as the churches physically rose during this building fever, so too they grew in prominence and appearance. Now, at first, cathedral builders all looked to one place, um, one direction for inspiration, for all roads led to Rome. In late antiquity, from the disappearance of the Romans from Britain, for example, in 410, by which time nearly all the lands of Western Europe had converted to Christianity, many bishops took the opportunity to construct their churches in imitation of Roman civic buildings. In particular, of course, the large multi-purpose aisled public building known as the Basilica. And thus the Romanesque cathedral with its hulking columns and semicircular arches and wide, broad naves, in imitation of these Roman forebears, was born. But by the <coughs> early 1100s, those aristocrats and churchmen who had journeyed to England, following, of course, William the Conqueror's Norman invasion, they now saw themselves largely as English. As they settled by 1130, for example, onwards, the growing wealth that the Congress had amassed, and indeed the newfound identity that had been created for this new ruling class, led to an incredibly vigorous new architectural patronage, as churchmen wished for new buildings in this new style in their new country. So as communications extended and roads allowed better travel, so the great barons, magnates, and church clergymen reorganized their castles and their dioceses. They built churches, they endowed churches, they built new cathedrals, they built new castles, and they reconstructed largely what cathedrals were still exist, were existing to. This was an age really for the first time of new building. Previous to this, most churches had been reconstructions and extensions of existing buildings. But soon we would enter the age of the new English cathedral and one of the greatest architectural achievements of Western civilization. So usurping the Romanesque, that solid, robust, earthbound architecture indebted to classical ancestors, the great age of cathedral building in Europe's Middle Ages would become stylistically associated though with something quite different. The architectural style they favored was ambitious, innovative and original, and can be summed up largely in one word, Gothic. Now the Gothic style held ground for around four centuries. The very pinnacle of its construction though arguably transpired between 1140 and 1280, but it was intended to be the metaphorical and physical exemplar of the celestial city, the heavenly Jerusalem following the apocalypse, as described in Book of Revelation 21 to 22. Remember at this time, 
As the most powerful institution of the age, the church influenced virtually every aspect of life from first breath to last rite. No wonder the Gothic cathedrals then exploded with light and the gleam of gold and jewel encrusted walls, colored glass and luminous pearl, all was in imitation as representations of this heavenly Jerusalem as so described in the Bible. And perhaps then it's no coincidence that the, na the nave, Latin navis, translates as ship. It was a vessel, a vessel for transporting souls from one world to the afterlife, to another realm. Virtually every single element then of a medieval cathedral had a symbolic meaning from its shape and its layout to the proportions and dazzling displays of color and glass, illustrating the entire spiritual universe from heaven to hell and everything in between. Proportion, ratio and symmetry were spiritual qualities which reflected the harmony and creation of medieval masons who cared passionately about them. The number 144, for example, is, is a good example of this. If we look at here, York Minster's Great East Window, there are 144 main light panels and 144 tracery panels of glass sort of in the top bit. And what does this window depict? Well, it depicts the beginning and end of the world, Genesis and Revelation, Alpha and Omega. And what did the number represent, 144? What it represented in Revelation was 144,000, was the number of those who would be saved. And 144 was the number of cubits that measured the wrong part of the celestial Jerusalem. Again, all of this is physically depicted and represented in this window. Now, of course, no one called Gothic Gothic at the time, however. In the 16th century, in fact, we get onto that, critics scoffed at this architectural approach. It was identified with the barbarian Goths of the Germanic lands who had overthrown the culture of ancient Rome in the fourth to fifth century. In 1550, the father of art history, as we know him, Giorgio Vasari, he even lambasted the style as a um, monstrous, barbarous, and disorderly. In reality, then, Gothic had very little to do with the Goths. It just got stuck with that nickname. But as a coherent set of stylistic principles, and the era in which they thrived, Gothic retained its potency and currency for centuries on. Indeed, it's now virtually inseparable from our very image in our minds of the word cathedral. Now, of course, though, the Gothic style did not explode fully formed. Gothic did not just arrive. Much Romanesque remained, particularly the round arch. That was until one French visionary who has, for the past century or so at least, been credited as the father of Gothic. And that man was Abbot Suger of the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, located just a few miles north of Paris. <laughs> Suger commanded a significant place in the political and royal sea. It was no surprise then that during the renovation um, of his Abbey Church, which occurred from about 1137 on, Suger looked to a style that proclaimed its central importance to the still fledgling, rather, French realm of the Cape Town Kings. Suger's and indeed his builders' quest for innovation resulted in, among other things, the use of the pointed arch. It was both stronger and more flexible than the previous round arch method. But it was not new. The world, in fact, had seen it before. Indeed, it may well have been in use in the Sassanian era, so 3rd to 7th century of the Persian Empire. For years, indeed, too, on English, Irish, Italian, and Scandinavian, even Spanish soil. Simple, unadorned lines of Cistercian monasteries um, sort of aplete with pointed arches. They, they pointed arches existed all over them, but we saw plain moldings added to thick Romanesque structures. And indeed on the Iberian Peninsula, it was full of complex and bullish structures of Islamic, by Islamic and Moorish masons. All of these featured pointed arches, and all then these masons were seemingly unaware, these masons who had created them, were seemingly unaware that they were effectively missionaries of the elements of this so-called new Gothic style. 
So rediscovered in the 12th century, we can call it that, I suppose, the pointed arch allowed buildings to be raised to once impossible heights. That it certainly did. And it was a new era of expectation where nothing under about 330 feet, that's 100 meters, was considered fitting enough for a house of God. So as the Gothic style progressed, though, it had two important aims, maximum height and maximum light, and these required fundamental reinforcement. The tall lancet window that we had seen for centuries, of course, brought light, but windows are indeed structurally weak. To achieve soaring verticality, while still creating the impression of delicacy, something else was needed. This arrived in the form of the flying buttress, whose arched, life, arched supports like outstretched limbs came to line the exterior of Gothic cathedrals, a little bit like a ribcage you can see here at Notre Dame. So with flying buttresses, walls could continue to climb upwards and expansive stained glass windows could be inserted between them. Another archetypal feature of Gothic was the stone reported roof made up of small diagonal arches. It started modestly in terms of height, we can see this at Saint-Denis, but its sophistication grew and it became possible as a result to build ceilings bigger, higher and stronger than ever before. So what we're seeing here is a unique combination of architectural ingredients. That was certainly what was born. In reality then, the cathedrals of the Middle Ages were a melange of imitation and invention, and Saint-Denis, merely, merely the earliest assemblage of the component parts that we would eventually call Gothic. Therefore, it was actually about far more than pointed arches. This was an engineering revolution, and a costly one at that. The extreme wealth of how, how much it took to build these cathedrals can be understood by noting that almost every major ecclesiastical settlement, at least in England, had become a vast building site by the 13th century, as each church, at least each cathedral, tried to outdo others, keep up with the Joneses, if you will, down the road, and all became locked in a petrol fundraising cycle. So from Westminster Abbey's mighty 40,000 pounds makeover, we can see Ely's new Eastern Arm, which cost about six to 7,000 pounds. Therefore building in the name of the Lord was an exceptionally costly business. For comparison, Henry II's budget for governing the entire country was just 24 to 36,000 pounds. So Westminster Abbey cost more than the running the entire country. Money well spent. But another misconception then is that the cathedral, the cathedral building as a whole, was a male only endeavor. Although there's a deafening silence about women's roles in scholarship to date, the archives do tell another story, though only in small groups. Women did labor on construction sites across Europe. And of course, higher status or aristocratic women, they were often patrons. A very good example of a woman involved in one side was Alice Brewer. She was an heiress of lands in Devon, and she gifted Salisbury Cathedral its dark Purbeck marble from her quarry in Worth Matravers on the Isle of Purbeck. She gave it for 12 years, in fact. Now, although some women held specialised roles, such as carpenters and masons, more often their tasks were rather menial, comparably menial, in, uh, compared to their male counterparts. Many acted as day laborers or workshop for women, charged with lugging water pails and provisions, digging ditches, or working as bricklayers or stonemasons, glaziers, assistants, etc. We don't really find any women as masters of their craft, but those belonging to the aristocracy, of course, could influence the design of the project or manage their own site. But during this big boom period, so we're looking around 1220 to 1350, when this cathedral crusade really took shape. Cathedrals, of course, had become now major landowners and political and economic powerhouses too, serving also judicial functions and providing even community and district services. Patrons of these great uh, structures, therefore, wanted to translate their ambitions, whether they were political or not, but into stone, into timber, into glass, 
and they weren't ashamed to donate great sums of money or to be somewhat vulgar about making sure that those uh, funds were sort of put on display, if you will. On a lighter note, of course, we must remember that cathedrals were theatres in an age before the professional stage. They were a locus for pageants, processions, and, for example, at York and many other places, mystery plays were put on for a bit of holy frivolity. They very much were the hub of the community. But above all, what this also illustrates is that they were revenue earners. We must take that into consideration. They were fundraising dynamos, as I've mentioned, that reached out to visitors predominantly through the cult of saints, whose relics, their bits of bodies, their bits and pieces, if you will, their reliquaries and their tombs and shrines where they were stored, attracted pilgrims from far and wide. Pilgrims, great masses, uh, pilgrims who would offer great masses of silver often in return for a swifter tour through to heaven or in the hopes of a miracle or a cure in the age before modern medicine. And in fact, as a result, marketing the efficacy of a patron saint, of well, the powers of a patron saint of a cathedral by touting their miracle tales, if you will, help these churches uh, with their ability to attract pilgrims through their door in what was, of course, a truly competitive market. I'd like to think of them a bit like modern day theme parks, luring visitors through their gates by offering the most exhilarating attractions. The equivalent of the roller coaster then in medieval Christendom was a gigantic, opulent, decorative and jewel encrusted saint shrine or tomb, with perhaps the spinning teacups the equivalent of a saint's finger bone housed in a small gilded and glass case. And here's a particularly interesting tale then about the importance of saints to York Minster, but also to the nation's political history. And it shows just the breadth of people that became saints. Now, York Minster did have its own saint. This was the former Archbishop William Fitzherbert. But in the late 15th century, his celestial celebrities was outshone by another. It was in fact a Lancastrian king. In 1471, the Lancastrian claim to the throne suffered a crushing blow when the deposed Henry VI was found dead, likely in London's Wakefield Tower. And this was after more than a decade of conflict with Edward IV of York. The murdered Henry was swiftly, if unofficially, honoured as a saint, as his posthumous cult grew among rich and poor alike. At York, a veneration of him centred on what you can see behind me here, the asymmetrical holy screen, the choir screen or pulpitum, which stretched right across the choir. On it were, um, was a royal army of 15 statues commemorating all of the past kings of the realm who strutted in niches in an unbroken sequence from William the Conqueror to Henry VI. But after the mysterious death of the pious Henry, his statue on the screen, it was a mature depiction of this former ruler, was treated as a sacred idol. Pilgrims would come to it, would venerate, venerate at it, leave pilgrim silver, leave lights before it. But this enraged King Edward. Um, he was enraged that his subjects had turned to the man he had overthrown and killed. And therefore, Edward commanded the Archbishop of York to castigate the unwelcome devotion as contempt for the church and disparagement of Edward's rule. The statue was allegedly removed and a public motion condemned veneration towards Henry ever more and vehemently prohibited his memory. In this way, Yorkminster tried to appease its Yorkist king, and Henry VI became persona non grata. But this did little to derail the cult, however, and the statue wasn't reinstated, though, until the early 19th century. But York still had St. William, so it had its own fair share for pilgrims to come venerate. But by no means, then, we can see that saints were all, they weren't all long dead, God fearing religious servants. They could be former kings or indeed peasants. And on that note, I'd like to bust a few more myth myths about cathedral, if you will. Oscar Wilde stated that experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes. Well, I think he's rather right, but although tinged with irony, Wilde's words are certainly a testament to medieval architects and masons. In essence, some of the greatest abbey churches and cathedrals, these seemingly divine, perfect representations of the heavenly Jerusalem, rather than 
perfectly designed, are often masterpieces of miscalculation, or perhaps that should be fortunate or misfortunate happenings, whether they're deliberate, accidental, or foolish. And these have wreaked havoc upon, but also shaped the fabric. Now, though invention could often bring disaster, catastrophe also heralded opportunity and discovery. From towering infernos to bodge jobs, medieval ecclesiastical fabric is a roster of the stories and characters and tales responsible for its creation. Now, of course, relatively few medieval masons had the opportunity to design religious buildings from scratch. Invention was commonly restricted by what was there already, by what had gone before, and therefore this required far more creative adaptation for the design. What often resulted then was an extraordinary mix of calamity, evolution, and revolution, innovation, etc., etc. Central or crossing towers were where this most commonly occurred. Now, central or crossing towers were really the bane of the medieval mason, the nuisance of them. The arches wanted, often wanted to push outwards, so the buildings were often guilty of misbehavior that could lead to collapse. Cathedrals were essentially a house of cards, where the placement of every individual stone, stone played a pivotal role. Nonetheless, as well as beneficial collapses, which we saw, for example, at Ely, um, towers also remained a consistent outlet, though, for creative ambition. <clears throat> An example of this comes after the tower was added to Wells Cathedral in the 14th century. The entire structure was threatened with collapse. It was discovered that the late addition of the hefty decorated style central structure, erected between around 1315 and 1322, was adding unbearable strain uh, to the entire church itself, so much so that it was forcing the rotund tree-like piers of the central crossing to sink causing cracks in the supporting arches, and you can see this behind me. In short, the cathedral, cathedral recently rebuilt was in danger of collapse. But a bold and original solution by the cathedral's master mason, William Joy, was its remedy. And it became one of the most memorable sites of all English architecture, and indeed a very identity of Wells Cathedral, still distinctive to us to this very day. It was the installation of what is behind me, these three strainer arches, one placed under each crossing arch to take the weight of the extra stories bearing down. And these mimic, of course, giant angry owl eyes or vast scissors, even a gigantic kiss, some people suggest. These great braces, which essentially saved the cathedral, they were installed by William Joy but they were actually a previously tried and tested method. Joy's response was in fact a mixture of ingenuity and experience. Now, Wells's plight was not among the great, was not among, uh, not new, sorry, among the great Gothic churches rising up. So the solution that Joy adopted was one that he himself had experimented with about a decade or so earlier, in the 1320s, a bit earlier indeed, but over at nearby Salisbury. Now at Wells, the three sweeping S shapes that together formed the figure X that you can see boxed in at right angles under each crossing arch, successfully braced and stabilized the structure. They framed rather than obscured the openness and light of the nave and crossing, but they were putting similarly at Salisbury before, but they're a little bit more, you couldn't see through if you go to the east end of Salisbury Cathedral and you look up, you will see some of these sort of bracing strain arches. So what Joy did was develop them, created a little bit more of an ingenious solution here at Wells. For a bit more of a, what we have here is a little bit more of a sophisticated um, relationship between the west and eastern space, their shape and the open work oculi of the owl eyes in the triangular spandles that you can see still allowed the laity who were largely confined to the nave that you can see here, partial sight of the east end during the solemn liturgical processions. Never was the design though so full of bravado replicated after Wells. So we do see this at Salisbury the first time and then at Wells, we don't see it again, unfortunately. Now, interestingly, um, there are many um, scholars who suggest that only 10% of the weight above the crossing tower at Wells is actually all that was um, shored up by them, so that could be why. 
Now, although careful attention was customarily paid to preserving old work on these cathedrals and matching it with the new, in many cases, the relief that the fabric still remained, the wall still remained and remained stable, was enough to simply add a handy roof boss, a decorative headstock, or a fancy bit of foliage to conceal any bodges. And so, or mistakes, and so fabric is actually often littered throughout cathedrals with rather comical corrections in some cases. Now, an abundance can be found at the east end of York. There are quite a few irregularities. In fact, you'll see this in all cathedrals, but York essentially is a little bit wonky at the east end if you really want to do look down it. And many of these at York too stem from the need to accomplish the work in several phases. At York, it was two phases throughout the 14th century. And of course, these arise, these problems arise um, from setting out a new structure designed to link the old with the new fabric. Well, one of the best examples uh, you can see here, it comes from the Benedictine Abbey Church at Selby, begun in the 1120s. Now, builders soon encountered that they had problems. Um, they had problems because they had commenced the construction of the crossing tower when only two bays of the nave had been completed, so not very much. The weight caused by the crossing piers, uh, so caused the crossing piers to sink below the level of the rest of the building, because that crossing tower is pushing down on very little um, other fabric. And it resulted in this quirky demonstration of differential settlement or wonkiness. So their options, of course, were either they could dismount the tower or they could tolerate the distortions now very much apparent in the fabric. The overseeing monks opted, of course, for the latter, likely probably to save the money because it was a cheaper option. But even though it involved blocking one bay of the gallery as a reinforcement, they were happy to put their mistake on display. And returning again to breaking stereotypes, these monastic morality tales, as many of them often are, are quite representative of a wider and rather familiar cultural stereotype. This is the promiscuous and corrupt man of the cloth. We see him appearing time and time again in these stories. But in short, cathedrals were not always referential space, spaces reserved only for solemn, respectful and dignified worship. In fact, they were far from it. If in fact we turn to the origins of Westminster Abbey, the construction of the abbey as we know it largely hinged on the incorrupt body of the last king and royal of the House of Wessex, not to mention a medieval monk spin doctor. Now, Edward the Confessor, he has preserved our incorrupt dead body as so found when his tomb was opened by the Westminster monks was proof of his blessed status. He was intact. But at this point, he wasn't actually a saint. And all around the country, cathedrals were vying for their own saints to entice pilgrims through their doors to provide monetary offerings in order that the religious communities could therefore furnish and rebuild these great houses of God. They're great representations of heaven on earth, of course. Westminster, without a saint then, began an active propaganda machine to promote Edward to celestial celebrity status. So toiling away, a well-oiled machine of scribes began pouring over vellum. They, they did this to create charters to enhance the Abbey's status and to emphasize their history, its history and special relationship with the pre-conquest Anglo-Saxon royal dynasty of Wessex. They were essentially forging their own family tree or their ancestry, trying to trace it back and back. The problem was that these documents were essentially forgeries. They were false documents that the Abbey needed to create to forge their connection with King Edward and one of continuity throughout history to the King who was distantly related to the conqueror. In short, the Westminster monks created a great web of counterfeits and lies, if you will, with the Abbey's royal credentials at its core. And it worked. The papal bull announcing Edward's canonization of a saint uh, was issued on 7th February, 1161. And speaking of straying from the spiritual path, we think, we often think that Salisbury Cathedral uh, simply emerged from its current site but in fact, it actually started life a few miles north. And the reason for its change in location was all down to effectively neighbors from hell. 
At the center of the bleak and grassy hilltop known as Old Serum, stood the first vast Romanesque cathedral in the area, which was enclosed within the circular earthwork from remnants of Old Serum's Iron Age past, and in the northwest grid of the castle, um, and its bailey thrown up by William I in 1078, so they were stood side by side, the castle and the cathedral. But all was not well at Old Serum. Firstly, even in the mildest of winters, gusts surged through the cathedral and the canon's living quarters. And then, of course, there were the disagreeable neighbours. The canons of the cathedral, now they clashed repeatedly with Old Serum's castellan or governor. And he, um, Peter of Blois, the French statesman, um, he called him an ungodly man who commanded a garrison of vile and rude soldiers. So the cathedral was nothing more than a prison holding its clerics captive. So the compact town of Old Serum then was simply too powerful for two, was sorry, too small for two powerful men, the governor and the bishop. Bishop Herbert Paul then, uh, the bishop of the cathedral, he began negotiations, or should I say he continued negotiations, to move his cathedral to a more auspicious location. And in 1219, the cathedral received papal permission to move it. And it moved two miles south of Salisbury Plain to where it stands today. But in choosing the ultimate location, according to legend, Bishop Paul, or at least his bowman, stood on the edge of Old Sarum, you can see depicted here, and shot an arrow high into the sky, vowing to build the new church wherever it landed. In a variation, the arrow struck a deer, uh, which ran off and died at the intersection of three ancient territories known as Murfield or Boundary Field. Well, I don't know if anyone has ever been to Old Serum and looked towards Salisbury Cathedral, but it's quite a long way. You would have to be a very good archer indeed to make that, make that shot. But there's a different yarn here, um, which eschewed bows and arrows altogether in favour of a vision of the Virgin Mary. But the Virgin Mary apparently appeared to the bishop and informed him where his cathedral should rise. Now, I'm perhaps going to favour um, the fact that the new cathedral was ultimately sited on lands owned by the bishop. It was a low-lying site upon a terrace at the bishop's manor of Milford. It was at the crossing point of two roads and on a sweeping bend of the Avon Valley downstream from the confluence with the River Nadder. So a pretty perfect site for all intents and purposes. So I think that's in fact why. But in sum then, nearly two millennia later is when I started, or at least when I started the book in relation to this, Europe's cathedrals, these towering displays of architectural virtuosity are scattered across our towns and cities, still inspiring admiration and reverence and comprising artful ingenuity and extraordinary engineering. For some, of course, they provide consolation during contentious times, hope amid despair. For others, they stand for heritage in the face of destruction, the solidarity of the past versus the fragility of the present or indeed uncertainty of the future. And what they really are too, is they show the collective human powers of spiritual and religious expression, indeed artistic expression as well. And as in the case of Westminster Abbey, which I started with, they also stand as stone monuments to royalty, our royal history. Yet, of course, buildings do not talk, but I think we can all agree that they are far from mute domains. Their stones certainly have stories to tell. Indeed, buildings are books without words, through the stones, the dead speak. So when, of course, we visit a great historic cathedral and appreciate its battle between resilience and decay, we see through its fabric the lives of others, our fellow human beings. Cathedrals then are important constituents in our bigger national stories too. They're witnesses to history, repositories of memory. And even in what's arguably a more secular time today, they can still inspire us with reverence, enough to make us worry, indeed, when they're threatened. Now, during the writing of my book, Heaven on Earth, I was reminded of this particularly pertinently because the world would watch helpless as Notre Dame de Paris suffered its destructive blaze in April 2019. And of course, we saw our churches and cathedrals become silent, empty vessels during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So, of course, let us not take our cathedrals for granted, nor those, indeed, who constructed them. So next time you stroll by the Albert Memorial in London's Kensington Gardens, perhaps cast your eyes up and pay homage to the 89 sculptors um, and architects there adorning Sir Gilbert Scott's 19th century frieze. Or if you should be so fortunate enough to stand outside the church of San Michel in Florence, pay a little respect to the 1413 relief commissioned by the Masons Guild, depicting their patron saints. They're all hard at work on a building site constructing a great monument. For of course, without them all, we would have no heaven on earth. Thank you. Most interesting. It's, it's nice to know that uh, having statues of the people you don't like very much removed <laughs> is not a new phenomenon. No, 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 definitely not. And uh, Dr. Wells is happy to take any questions. Stunned in silence. It's often said that um, um, around the building of cathedrals was the, the rise of organised labour. Yes, yeah. Uh, Europe as well. can, you, can you say a bit about that? Is, it, is that as true as we think it is, or is it slightly different? Well, I would probably agree with you um, for several reasons. There is obviously the um, idea of the cult of carts, which was essentially where the whole community was involved in cathedral building. We see this, there's evidence of this at Chartres, at Saint-Denis in France. And as I say, it's at every level of society were involved. What's really interesting too at Chartres, the local tradesmen are depicted in the stained glass windows. So you can see certainly that we start, that this occurred, this cult of carts, this certainly occurred. But also given how, for example, the stonemasons were paid, and that's where we get some Freemasonry from, um, that really was a very well-run operation. Um, we sort of moved away from a sort of, I don't want to say feudal system, but sort of, into very much well-designed, well-run metropolis, um, as I say, with every member. So, yes, now... There are some that believe that the cult of carts is a bit of a theory, that it never existed, that we didn't have every level of society involved in our cathedrals. But given the evidence and the, the fact that they would put people of all trades or society as in the iconography of stained glass windows, I think very much proves it. We even see it, we see it in England, in York, the North Naval in York. Um, you can see it quite a lot. There's lots of different trades in the windows. They clearly gave the money for it. So, yes, I think is the answer to that. So, yes, thank you. Um, I don't think I was aware that poor women did any of the manual labor yeah. things. thing. Why, why is that? Why is that something that's sort of been so, how did that get kind of linked out of history? Because they, because they weren't masters of their craft, I suppose. So we only know, um, we only know a, a little bit, really, in in comparison about the master masons, and we know because they were simply the master masons of the cathedral or of the churches. So we know quite, quite a bit about them. Then we know bits and pieces about how the the trades going downwards occurred, but we know that more from documentary evidence about how they were paid or the type of jobs that they were doing. Um, and within them, we have therefore have the illuminated manuscripts with depictions of what's going on. So throughout all this evidence, there just isn't simply the women there to prove that they were anything more than anywhere near masters of their craft. I suppose that's not entirely unsurprising, given that you know women didn't work essentially. So, it, go on. I'm sorry, I'm just surprised because I, 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 like, like I said, I wasn't really aware that they did that kind of work at all. I knew women worked in house songs and some sort of service. Yeah, it's very menial. Yeah. Every, no. You never hear about being manual No, and, and they were they were sort of doing very menial tasks. That's the thing. They were assistants, lugging water, those sorts of things. And we only really know that. The documentary is very sparse, but there are a couple of illuminating manuscripts that do depict women working away, some of them which I showed it's very, very scarce. So we know that they were clearly possibly there. And we do find throughout the medieval era, women taking over their men's roles occasionally if the, if the man had died. Um, it's very rare, but it is there in glimpses. So 
I, I, it's certainly an area of study that needs to be more developed. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. If you have a question to our mind. So we have a question from um, uh, Rory Back. Um, Rory says, Thank you, Dr. Wells. Very interesting. We are spoiled for 20th century. Uh, sorry, we are spoiled for yes, 20th century cathedrals, I think, in my hometown of Liverpool. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, are there any new cathedrals, Gothic or not, being constructed in the world? Um, <laughs> Sagrada Familia. Yeah, it's not Gothic, though, but yes, yeah, Sagrada Familia. Um, there is a really, in the conclusion of my book, I also meant to mention a gentleman. Jose, I can't remember his name, a Spanish gentleman, who built a cathedral himself just outside Madrid of until he was not, I can't remember how old he was when he died. He was in his 90s when he died only a couple of years ago, as I was writing the book. So I think he died 2019, 2020. Um, and he built a cathedral from pieces of bicycles, um, <laughs> just literally anything he'd get his hands on. He didn't get planning permission for this either. So it was threatened to be torn down several times, but it is there and you can go and visit it. And it is the size of a cathedral. That He was a Trappist monk previously, and he'd been just laboring, toil toiling away for decades and decades. So that's, that's one, and that's probably the most interesting thing. But um, yeah, it's a grand familiar. I mean, I can't lie. So it's not technically a cathedral. It's, yeah, technically, I think it is called a cathedral. <laughs> well, it's arguable, I think, that it's a rather familiar. Has never been finished. Never finished. Well, and are cathedrals ever really finished, though, which is another. They're constantly evolving, constantly developing, though. But I think it's technically cast as finished, isn't yes, it? Yes. Yeah. 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 But then, as I say, are cathedrals ever really finished? Yeah. Question yet. Yeah. Sort of along those lines, though, the reconstruction of Notre Dame, right? I know they've thrown a huge amount of mm. modern technology at it for yeah. essentially rebuilding this very old structure within the, the cultural influences of modern day. Yeah. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are of how that's going and is it all up towards? <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't it always been? I mean, nothing's really changed. Um, I mean, it was about medieval tourism, that was yeah. pilgrimage. So, and the cathedral, I think. Firstly, I think we do think of cathedrals as very sacred, solemn spaces, even when we go into them today. But when we walk into a nave, if we'd have walked into the nave in the medieval era, it was very much a hustling, bustling place with all the things going on. So there's that, but, um, well, it's, it's, what do I think of it? Well, what I can say about France is, I do know, is that they do have the sort of medieval on skill set that, is perhaps dying a little bit more in England. And they very much, the government, et cetera, very much fosters those skills. There are far more apprenticeships and they are trying to use that in order to, to rebuild Notre Dame. Um, so that's, you know, I, I think that's great. Do I agree with it entirely the way they're doing it? Well, I'll keep my mouth shut when it comes to that. <laughs> This is not a question so much, but I'm sure you're aware of it, but just to talk about tourism, um, that and how important it was for everybody to have yeah. a saint as a draw card. Yes. Um, there's a lovely 14th century motet. Uh, one, one, and this is the, the era of poly textual motets where mm -hmm. you have several being sung at the same, several sets of words being sung at the same time, and yes. one is about. Um, St Thomas of Canterbury, but the other one is about St Thomas of de la Hale, who was yes. newly yes. uh, founded as a saint for Dover, and it's sort of thing that, you know, get the pilgrims going down to Canterbury, well, you know, we'll see you about, but Thomas of uh, Dover, let's go a little bit further exactly. with him as well. Yes, exactly. You know, the more saints you could visit on, on routes, that was that was very much it, and it, it is a little bit like you would collect your pilgrim badge as well, and and in the hope of cure or miracle or whatever it was, or even just a nice day out sometimes as well. Yes. Um, here in Durham, we've yeah. got the apprentices column. Yes. Um, yeah. What is your explanation of that? Right? Yeah, we were having this conversation. Yes. Right. Yes. We were having this conversation right before this. Oh. Um, so, the apprentice column in the south transept um now people call it the apprentice column because essentially there's a mistake on it um the way the chevrons sort of go but it's it's very different as well to the others in the area but 
I do believe, so I believe it was Eric Fernie, Professor Eric Fernie, that both that sort of started this idea that, and he indeed he's right, that it was perhaps a way to signify that there was, well, where originally Cuthbert's two moors in the first cathedral. But if you look in Durham Cathedral, this is quite common in many churches, in fact, that mouldings or more increased de decoration um, is a signifier of the most significant areas within a church itself. And we can see this at Durham, sort of as you get more to the East End, you do find a lot of this sort of chevron molding, the sort of the baldish chin over where the ferretry was, where Cuthbert was. So you have these columns with this, these moldings very much signifying where the most important parts were in relation to St. Cuthbert's cult. And the idea is that that was another area for this so that you would sort of luck around for those. And there was a very distinct pilgrim route that you would have followed anyway as a pilgrim in Durham Cathedral. So that does make sense. The other suggestion is that it was just a mistake and that the blocks were sort of put together oddly um, and you get this sort of odd little chevroni bit. But I do certainly think there was something of significance in that area. So I go either way, to be honest. Um, um, what, what about that idea that um, it was done on purpose to what? demonstrate humility and um, man's sort of, um, I, you know, before God? No, I don't. I don't subscribe to that theory. Yeah. Really, I think I think that seems to be why. I might, I might uh, add a point there. My wife is a quilter, and the cat, apparently they always, whenever they're doing any quilting, they always make a deliberate mistake, so that I'm, the piece of work is not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> There's belief about that, which is because you've sold everything, creating. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's mistakes in every cathedral. This is the point. Cathedrals are littered with mistakes. This is this is the point. You know, they people people are people. They make mistakes. So I think I don't subscribe to that theory. It's an interesting one. And given the location, I I quite like the theory that it was something significant. But jury's still out on that. Although scholars would argue the other way, but. Anne Harrison asks, uh, do we have any evidence of medieval ecclesiastical architects and builders taking account of a cathedral's acoustic quality of singing or instrumental music? Yeah, yeah, there's quite a lot of this now. It's certainly not my area of expertise, um, but yes, is the answer to this. Um, cathedrals were very, very much built with um, acoustic properties and qualities in mind. In fact, the entirety of the space is built for sensory experience. Um, my own PhD was on sensory experience of pilgrimage art and architecture. Um, I could go on and on about this, but the the short answer is that yes, there's there's a lot of this, um, a lot of theory in the way that the cathedral is designed, particularly choir areas, etc. Yeah. And there's very interesting um, sort of what you said about pointed arches. Yes. In Durham, um, we've always been under a strong impression that our pointed arches in the nave were pioneering architecture, which led on to the body style. Mm -hmm. What you were saying well, rather flattened that idea. Yeah. I wonder if you can get to comment a bit further. I've heard this before, yes. Um, but, well, pioneering perhaps in England, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that pushing it, in a cathedral perhaps, I'm trying to think whether there's any earlier pointed arches, I can't think that there is anything earlier in a cathedral in England. Can you see it on Cistercian architecture? Yes, that I can, I think. So we'll go with yes and no, because for cathedrals, yes, I can't think off the top of my head that there's any earlier pointed arches, but again, I could, yeah. But I mean, there, there's a lot of, there's always interesting theories and, and things put to you, but, uh, pointed arches were used throughout we'll say Europe but even wider um, on all types of different architecture it's just that we tend to attribute them or associate them with the gothic era it was just that sort of mix of elements so it's pretty good yes the sheer scale and the size of the pointed arches is quite amazing to everybody and fascinated by the uh Achievement of symmetry and accuracy, mm -hmm. and high elevations with huge blocks. Yeah. You know, um, 
and matching carvings on some distance away, the whole of that without modern instruments. Do we have very much information about how, how this was achieved, what techniques were used? Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of um, engineering is quite interesting. Um, so obviously, geometry and proportion was extremely an extremely important theories to the construction of cathedrals it everything is sort of i believe at durham i want to say that it's if you draw a dry, diagonal line across the um cloister that's the i think it's the length of the nave i want to say two everything has its proportion and symmetry and theory behind it um so there is that now in terms of how they physically put them together, if you will. Um, we have, for example, um, some surviving windlasses, which are the big, great big hamster wheels that men would sort of pile around and all, um, you have sort of a basket on the bottom to winch up. Um, so for example, if you were building your tower afterwards, you'd put your windlass in the crossing and then you build everything up. There's one at Salisbury, Peterborough and Beverly. I think they're the three main remaining yeah. ones. So right in the crossing, if you go to Salisbury and look up, there's a bit of a hole and that's that's where that is. Um, so, I mean, there's scaffolding, timber scaffolding. So that's different to us, but it would, would be metal. So there's all different types of machines, but they're actually all based on things that we actually still use to this day, many of them. But geometry, proportion, all of that, very key. Now at Salisbury's North Nave Isle, in fact, um, and again, you can see this, Wells has a tracery house and York Minster has a tracery floor. So they did sort of trace out, if you will, the proportions, one-to-one um, -one even in some scales. If you go to York Minster's tracery house, which is just um, sort of above the chapter house vestibule, you can get access to that. I think they do on some of the tours. You can see some of the um, nave windows literally etched onto the floor, scribed into the floor. Um, so you can see which ones they are. Um, I say Wells has a similar tracery house. And at Salisbury in the North Nave Isle, there is a great big, well, it's about to speak, octagon on the, which has been sort of etched into, scribed into the wall itself. Um, and of course the crossing, above the crossing, that's an octagon shaped chapter house is, but I don't think it was the chapter house, but the octagon of the crossing tower, it sort of matches. And they did do this. They did do sort of little models and sort of little templates. So all of this they, they they put together, and they did make little models like timber timber models of cathedrals as well to put them together. So that was before sort of big, as we use sort of three D plans and things like that. Yeah. So I can ask a question. You you gave us the example of Westminster costing yeah. more than the amount it, you, to run the country run the country for a year. Yeah. So we know where the money went. Where did it come from? <laughs> Same place, really. Um, the church. How, in other words, how could the money be commanded to, to this project? Well, the church was particularly wealthy and still is. Um, so all different reasons, of course, as I say, the church simply had a lot of money to do it. But churches and cathedrals were constructed using funds from different places. So a lot of them were patrons and donors. You're giving you know vast sums of money to have your stamp effectively. You know, a lot of wealthy magnates and barons, they would um, etc. Nobles would perhaps endow a chantry chapel as we go on to the medieval era, um, or certain areas of a church, you would get patrons. That that's you know, so you put it all together essentially. But we have to think the church was the most wealthy institution there was. Um, so they had vast amounts of reserves. Um, and then you had everyone contributing too, in order to, as I said, A, put their stamp on it, but B, in order to get through purgatory, essentially get through to heaven. And that's why we get chantry chapels, magnificent chantry chapels, sort of cage chapels, etc. And you would have a priest, you would get them constructed, usually during your lifetime, in fact. And then when you die, you would have a priest to say masses um, for your soul once you're dead, you know, however many times a day, depending on depending on how much money you've had until the money ran out or until um, Edward came along, Henry's son, and got away, did away with them. So, yeah. so on that note, I know that a lot of um, castles in the UK were funded for by, um, I know that several rulers actually welcomed in uh, members of the Jewish population of Europe. Yeah, yeah. Because at the time, um, Christianity 
or they need money lending with interest until a loophole was found that allowed it. So they would identify Jewish people because they could be money lenders mm -hmm. or stereotypes. Yeah. I know that a lot of castles were paid for that way. Were any cathedrals? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Not that I, I've never heard that. I, so I, you know, I don't want to say no, but I've never heard that. But, That's fair but sure. yes, I, I'm well aware of the Jewish castle connection. So yeah, but no, I don't think so. Good question. Greetings, Alessandro. Um, he asked, What is Emma's opinion on the best cathedral built in Great Britain <laughs> in terms of architectural standard? And overall popularity. Thank you. Uh, I've not escaped that question. Um, um, I, I think Durham. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, can I, Salisbury is my favourite, which is probably surprising, but it's because it was built. It was built in thirty-eight years, so it's pretty much the quickest cathedral that was ever built. Um, but it's because the reason being is because it looks. Sort of underwhelming in relation to Durham or York or Canterbury, very, very early English in its style. But it's it's a secular cathedral, so it's built largely for liturgy. That's where the Sarum Rite um, originated from. So it's all very much built for this procession. And the more you find out about it, you wouldn't know it today if you went in and that it was, you know, you had this great Saint Osmond, local saint. Um, you wouldn't know it today. It's, it's sort of been moved around, reordered a lot, but there's just so much to explore at Salisbury that's not immediate to the eye. And of course, Magna Carta is there and can go on and on. So, tallest spire now. It also, it also has two magnificent trees in the quadrangle, which are really quite simple to go back to. I could go on, yes. Yeah. Yes, it's, there's just loads. The only thing I don't like is the, uh, the new water display installation thing in the middle of the knee. Well, I'm going to uh, close the proceedings out and ask uh, Dr. John Warren, the Vice President of the Senate, to uh, um, give a vote of thanks to our speaker. Thanks very much, Bob. Yes, I want to give a vote of thanks to Emma for coming to talk to us tonight, Alex. So, but before that, we'll have a look. We'll get on the camera. So, the hour can see the wall. Right, and then we'll hear the chances to be Right, before I give the vote, thanks to Emma for uh, a fantastic uh, lecture. I want to uh, say another couple of thank yous as well, because uh, it, it takes a lot of work to get uh, this lecture off the ground with a lot of planning. Uh, this one's been quite a long time in the, uh, coming. Uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mark Miller, our uh, SCR president for uh, doing the, all the tech tonight. Could be you anything around the world? And secondly, before uh, I move to the I want to say a really big thank you to Bob as chair of the fellows, Dr. Bob Cummins, for putting this lecture together, doing all the arrangements for it. Uh, it's fantastic. Bob, well, is this the 19th you've organised, or is this the 19th lecture, or? It's the 19th of total. I think I've done about 10 of them. Right. Brilliant. Okay, uh, yeah, so I'm really going to do another one next year as well. It's been fantastic. <laughs> and before I thank you, I'd like to thank all of you for coming uh, to uh, see uh, this lecture tonight. It's been great, it's been fantastic turnout, online turnout is great. And uh, what you, once you started asking questions, you didn't want to stop, did you? Yeah. Well, you know, you just a little slide to start off with. But I've really enjoyed the, the lecture too as well. I particularly like the discussions on the idea that builders make mistakes because it's good for their soul. <laughs> that explains quite a lot of stuff in new university buildings. <laughs> <laughs> okay, finally, I'd like you all to give a really big round of applause and appreciation for Emma. For, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you for talking to us. It's been fantastic. We hope you come back and listen. Yes, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Very much.